What's going on y'all? Riley here and today we're going to be talking about the first volume of World Peace from Viz Media. So stay tuned. Alright, so first I want to thank Viz Media for sending me this review copy of World Peace and giving me the opportunity to make this review video. Thank you so much. Now let's get into it. So World Peace is the latest in Viz's line of originals, which means that they are originally published by Viz rather than being translations of existing works. And the story focuses on our main character of Lucas Denson. Lucas Denson is, as things tend to go, just a normal, average high schooler. Uh, he plays on the basketball team, he has friends, he enjoys manga, he's pretty popular with the girls it seems. Just your everyday average teenage guy. And um, the beginning of the story gives us all that exposition and we see him playing in a basketball game and helping their team win at the behest of someone on the other side who just seems very unhappy about this fact. He goes on and meets with his friends and stuff, they talk a little bit and then he goes off to see his mom and his mom informs him, hey Lucas, I was able to get you a guest pass so that you can visit my work. And she gives a little bit more information on the character by telling us, you know, she says to him, just don't get in trouble like last time, follow all the rules. So now we get the idea that Lucas might be a bit of a troublemaker. His mom works at like an archaeological dig site and they head over to this dig site and very quickly we're told that this was the former location of the local library. But one day the library just disappeared. Okay. So that we've got the first question, what happened to this library? Why did it disappear? Where did it go? And they're trying to figure out what happened, but all they're finding are these weird artifacts. And these artifacts, they don't know the significance or what they are, where they're from. Um, so they have no idea why this would have happened. So Lucas is standing at one of the dig sites and his mom has to go do something and she says, hey, don't get into any trouble, don't touch anything. And of course, automatically something happens. He drops a shovel into the hole and hears a clang. So he calls out to have someone come check it out, but there's no one around. So he jumps in to grab the shovel and finds that that clang was because it had hit another one of those artifacts. And he inadvertently winds up touching the artifact and it warps him to some mysterious dark place where there's nothing around but just him and a globe, which he soon finds to be the earth. So. Lucas is thrown into this unknown dimension, basically, and the Earth has been shrunk down to the size of a basketball. And very soon, another character shows up named Loli. And Loli explains to Lucas that he's kind of in this place between places, that no one really goes there. She's like, but let me, let me bring you back to my home and I'll help you out and we'll try and figure this thing out. Because he explains to her what had just happened. And this begins really the journey of the story. This is where we see Lucas then make his first friend and they begin to form their party as they go forth and trying to figure out how to turn the earth back to normal and to get Lucas back to all his people. The story plays out, um, if, if you couldn't tell from that bit of exposition and like the plot outline that I gave, it, it feels a lot like an RPG. It feels like a Final Fantasy game or a Tales game or something where we meet these characters, we're introduced to the conflict, and they begin to form a party. And it even has like each party member that they, they gather along the way, has their own weapons that they use. Uh, Lucas winds up, and I have some questions about this, um, Lucas winds up using the Earth as a weapon, kind of reminiscent of Waka from Final Fantasy X using a Blitzball. But they begin their quest and, and they have their motive is to find out how to get the earth back and they're given like different people tell them oh you should talk to this person you should go do this you should go do this and so they're they're going from basically task to task and event to event trying to figure out you know what's going on and it plays out a lot like an rpg game and i i feel like that might be on purpose i i, I don't want to put words in the creator's mouth but it seems like that was kind of the intent for this to feel like that kind of story but with that do come a few shortcomings because as people know with a lot of video game adaptations, the story winds up being condensed down quite a bit because in video games, most of what you're doing is the in-between events. Most of what you're doing is 
playing through from point A to point B, fighting the villains along the way, and then eventually getting to the next major point in your story where you probably fight a boss and then you get told to go do this other thing. But in adaptations, that time in between where you as the player would be playing through the majority of the game is usually cut very short because that's where there's less story and it's more just the involvement of the player. And it sometimes feels that way in here because it feels like the characters are bouncing from event to event to event really quickly rather than having a lot of that downtime in between. And it's something, just a pacing thing that can be easily overcome, um, but there were times when I was reading this volume that I felt, wow, we just moved from one event to another event very quickly with, with very little like downtime or exposition in between. It's not a con consistent or constant thing, it's just an observation that I had. But we do throughout this first volume see the characters go on and meet new characters and have to fight against villains and we do get introduced to who seems like they're going to be the major antagonist of the series, but you get the feeling that maybe this person is just working underneath someone else. And there's a lot of good action sequences in here too. We do get to see Lucas and Loli and, and their party get together to fight against certain adversaries. And Agroshka's artwork can be very detailed without being confusing at all. And readers of a lot of manga and comics know that sometimes you have an artist who gets way too kinetic with their artwork and you can get lost in what's going on. You can get lost in uh, the, the line work and, and really understanding what's happening in each panel, but that never happens with Agroshka's artwork. And I will say that my favorite part about their artwork is the amount of detail that goes into the backgrounds and the atmospheres around the characters in almost every single scene, because you really feel like you're in another world. This is really great because you start out on Earth with things that would seem familiar and then move to some fictional sci-fi world where everything is different and it just, it works really well. That's something that I really appreciated about Agroshka's artwork here. I also want to say that I'm really glad that I read through this a second time for this review because there are little notes in here, little things that pop up that really wind up informing a lot about this story that I completely missed the first time. At least, in my opinion, it seems like stuff that informs uh, what might happen as the story goes forward. And it made me really a lot more excited about reading the eventual second volume and seeing where these characters go on their quest. Now, I will say that this first volume does seem like a lot of exposition. It seems like there's a lot of introduction to these characters and to the world that they're in, and that going forward might see this expanded quite a bit more. Like, going back to the idea that this is playing out like an RPG, it seems like this book covered the first part, maybe the first dungeon worth of material or something, and then as we go forward, it's going to open up the world quite a bit more than what we've seen here. And that's something that I'm really looking forward to. That said, I, I want to read the next volume of this. If that's any indication of my feelings of the of the book, I do want to pick up the next volume and see what's going on with these characters as it goes forward. There were some issues narratively that I think could have been done better. Some of the dialogue can be a little bit clunky or forced. And as I had mentioned before, the storyline seems to jump from point to point without spending much time in between for downtime with these characters. But overall, it's an intriguing read that created a world and a situation that I would like to know more about. I want to know not just how they solved the issue, but the main thing is why this happened in the first place. Why did the library disappear? Why did the earth shrink down? What's going on here? So World Peace Volume 1 by Josh Tierney and Agroshka is available now. Wherever books are sold, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other places. So it does have a T-plus rating on it, meant for older teens, but I do feel like there's not a lot of mature material in here, and I would recommend it for kids who are in that middle grade range. Um, there's some violence and maybe a little bit of language, but nothing too extreme. However, if you're a parent and you're wanting to pick the book up for your kids or anything, I would recommend looking through it first just to make sure the material is suitable because I'm not a parent and every parent has different opinions on these things for their own children, of course. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you spending the time with me. Hopefully the video was entertaining and informative as always, and maybe you'll decide to go pick up a copy of World Peace yourself. 
See you on the next one. Peace out.